Hi everyone and thank you for joining us at the British Library Online. I'm Leslie Downer. We're here to find out all about Japanese textile design books and their exquisite patterns. And we'll start with a wonderful film by Hamish Todd. Hamish is the head of East Asian collections here at the British Library and has been since 2010. He read Japanese at Cambridge and went to Japan in the early days of the jet scheme, as did I. He then lived and worked in Japan for several years as an English teacher and translator for Suntory, I gather. He joined the British Library in 1986 and has dedicated his career to curating, researching and developing the library's rich Japanese collections, making them accessible to as wide an audience as possible. He knows a huge amount about Japan and all things Japanese, and he also blogs on the British Library's website, so do follow his fascinating blogs. So today he's going to share some of his knowledge about the wonderful pattern books in the British Library's collection. As you've heard, this project actually began as an exhibition, which was then prematurely closed down by lockdown. And so it's now to be a permanent online exhibition, all the more exciting that we can bring it back to life again. So, first of all, it's really wonderful to see these books right here in front of me. They're marvellous, beautiful kind of colour illustrations. Um, very fortunate to be able to touch them, goodness, um, and the kind of intricacy of the, of the painting. Um, one thing this makes me think of straight away is, I think you said something about this being to do with fashion. But of course, um, here in the West, as you know, fashion is all to do with the cut of a, of a garment and how it's put together. So how can these pattern books be to do with fashion? I mean, that, that's a very interesting point. I think it's worth bearing in mind that in Japan, the aesthetic was um, not about fitting items to the contour of the body. It was about the fabric. It was about the painting. It was about the design, the colours. So it was a completely different way of looking at what was fashion. The, the actual shape of the garments didn't change that quickly certainly not as quickly as they do in the West. So really, I mean, we think of a kimono as something to wear, but to some extent it was, or maybe to quite a large extent, it was seen as a canvas almost, wasn't it, where the it, artist could paint? Yes, it was giving a whole range of messages to, to, the, to the viewer and yeah. uh, f from the wearer. And there's that marvellous story that Saikaku writes about Kaoru the courtesan, um, who had this glorious piece of satin, I think, and she got artists to paint on it, then she got poets to write poetry on it, and then she thought, this is way too beautiful to hang on the wall. This has to be a kimono. Um, so it's like the idea that hanging something on the wall is quite boring, um, but if you actually make it into something you can wear, then it goes from being a kind of two-dimensional flat thing to being you know, a three-dimensional work of art, basically. I mean, that, that, that's part of the issue. I, mean, I was explaining that um, kimono are normally displayed in that T-shape so that you can see the, the whole pattern across the back. But it was worn, so it was intended to be worn and movement and sound is all part of the aesthetic of, of the kimono, that wonderful noise that people make when they sort of shuk, 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 when they move <laughs> along in a kimono. So in terms of, of the artists, um, was, it, was it as prestigious or more prestigious to be a designer of pattern books as to do, for example, woodblock prints. I mean, did people like Hokusai do these pattern books? It, it's, it's interesting because um, we have to bear in mind these people were trying to earn a living. So I oh. think that they would turn their hand to what, whatever was on offer. I don't think there was um, any shame in, in, in producing these pattern books when called upon. Yeah, I mean, I, I got the impression that actually pattern books were, were, were at one point prestigious and that um, people could make their name, perhaps, by doing pattern books. I think Moronobu did pattern books, didn't he, I gather? He did. And, he did a lot um, of pattern books. Um, and various other artists, um, Skinobu and, and people. But the um, trouble is that in many cases we don't actually know who the artist was. Ah. Um, I want to ask whether there were, there were also, also women artists, like Hokusai's daughter, but I suppose... There may well have been. Um, but mm -hmm. if we don't have the names, we don't know the gender. So, yes. uh, yeah, speculation. Can you tell us a little bit more about the British Library's Japan collection? Are there lots more of these books besides the ones that you've shown us? There are, and I'm very pleased to say that we're, we're, we're still acquiring um, pattern books. It's part of the collection we're expanding. 
but they're within the context of Japanese language holdings of about 80 to 90,000 volumes, which cover manuscripts, printed books, from the very beginnings of printing in Japan in the 8th century, right the way through to the modern period. I must confess that, to me, the most interesting and perhaps important part of the collection are the pre-modern books, such as we see here today. That, that's the thing that uh, yes. really interests me. But um, it is a living collection and we try to support contemporary research in a whole range of fields, given the budget that we have. Um, so were these books much used? Are these... Are they, they well-handled volumes? Well, I mean, I, I don't know if the camera can pick this up, but th th this one in the front, you can certainly see along the corners that people with rather grubby fingers have been, um, have been using them. Um. <laughs> so, um, as far as I know, in the Edo period, there were certain fabrics that, um, for example, only the women of the shogun's um, castle could wear. There were certain fabrics that were only allowed to the women of the imperial palace um, and there were lots of fabrics that for example townswomen couldn't wear um, so garments were kind of controlled by the sumptuary law system yeah. is that reflected in the pattern books that's a very good point <laughs> i mean yes there was an effort to control yeah. um conspicuous consumption through these sumptuary laws which was mainly about hiding the discrepancies in wealth that the merchant class who were actually in the traditional system, the lowest ranking part of society had the most money. So that the government tried to control the appearance of wealth. But I think it's probably safe to say that people found ways around these laws. And, um, you know, you could have a, a, maybe an undergarment that had some of these forbidden fabrics. People were endlessly creative, I'm sure. Um, so were there, were there, what about onagata? What about the male actors of women's roles? I wonder if there were particular designs that they would have gone for. I think they would definitely have been among the sort of leaders of a fashionable society and the sort of styles maybe that uh, people admired on the stage, but whether they would actually want to dress like one in real life, I'm not so sure. I certainly don't have any of our pattern books which are specifically designed for that, but Onagata, you know, they were they were um, almost a, 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 a form of behaviour that mm. people aspired to, women aspired to. You know, they they learnt from Onagata how how a lady was supposed to behave. So, uh, yeah, very influential figures in many aspects of Japanese culture. Do um, put in your questions. If anybody has a question, um, do send them in, and I shall pass them on to Hamish. Um, so what about the consumers? Could, for example, um, if you were an ordinary person, you could buy one of these pattern books and you could look at the kind of designs that a courtesan might wear. Yeah. Um, so it would be a little bit maybe like Vogue, do you think? Or? Yeah, I, I think there are lots of different uses for these. As, as I said in the film, some of them are obviously practical in nature. They would have been taken by the kimono merchant to his high-ranking clients, who wouldn't be expected to come to the shop, obviously. And they could go through and have a discussion and you know, choose a design or a fabric in discussion with the um, kimono merchant. Other people would go to the shop, flick through and maybe find something. Other people might, as you say, just like a fashion magazine today, enjoy looking at the pictures without ever intending or having the means to have a kimono made up. So I wonder how much they cost. I mean, were they... <laughs> Do we have any idea at all, or do we not know? It, I mean... I mean, were they cheap like Vogue, or were they you well, know, collector's it, items? It, it depends what you buy. Yeah. Um, nowadays, for instance, you, you can go into a, a department store or look on a website, and you can get a kimono for you know a couple of hundred pounds, but it'll be made out of an inferior yeah. fabric. Um, whereas if you go to the higher end, you know, you're pay, talking tens of thousands of pounds, if not more. I think the sky's the limit, really. What about the books? I wonder how much they would cost. The books are not quite so expensive. Um, it's vulgar to discuss money. But, um, <laughs> That's true. We, we are still being 
uh, able to acquire them even with our modest means. So you can pick up some of these quite cheaply. But what about uh, if you were a merchant's wife, is what I meant. I mean, if you were, oh, in the, back yeah, in the day? Yeah, oh, back well. in the day. <laughs> yeah. um, we don't really have much evidence as to how much these yeah. cost. Um, Again, some of them, you know, these early ones were particularly intended that we know about were, were actually in shops and used by the merchants themselves rather than for, sold to the mass market. So. so you have the books sort of there so that merchants can sell their wares, there so that merchants can advertise their wares, yeah. also there so that um, people designing kimonos maybe could get ideas. Will that be another? Thing oh, that's absolutely them? true. Yes, and and that goes for the, the zuancho later as well. That was very right. specifically the one of the reasons for for creating those. That you had these designs, which anybody producing um, arts and crafts, including textiles, right. could use. Um, it's quite difficult to match up a design with an actual kimono and say that was based on that. You can match themes, perhaps, but not specific designs. What about the process once I've gone into the shop um, and I've had a look at this kimono book and I've said, OK, I'd like this one. Um, do you, is this part of your kind of knowledge of what would happen then or, or To not? be honest, no. No, right. Um, one could imagine, presumably, the merchant would then take that design to a dyer or an embroiderer um, and then who would then uh, put it onto the silk and then it would all be stitched together. So you would, so you could go from that. You could also make adjustments to the design, couldn't you? You could oh, say, yes. yeah. you know, I don't, I don't like this particular bit of it. Could I, could I please change it? I think it's probably worth saying you probably have a lot more knowledge about um, oh. the actual wearing of kimono <laughs> and the processes than I do from your experience. That, uh... um, yeah, I mean, we were going to talk about geisha a bit, yeah. weren't we? Yes, that's true. Um, I mean, talking about the different sorts of kimono that different sorts of people wear. Mm. Um, I remember being in Kyoto and um, seeing Michael, the trainee geisha, with their enormously lavish kimono with the long furisore, the long sleeves, mm. um, and then geisha who wear a very modest kimono, um, and then the taiyu who are the courtesans. There are still women that, who dress as taiyu. I think yeah. I think there were six, or there were six yeah. at last counting. Um, who wear very, very spectacular kimono. Mm -hmm. So the concept of, of kimono as being one thing, one kind of undifferent object, yeah. seems to be completely wrong. Yeah. And I do wonder whether ordinary people would be able to get a pattern book um, with pictures of a Taiyu's kimono. I wonder whether they'd be able to see that, or would that be like seeing a Versace gown or something? I mean, would it be like like when you can you can see the the fashionable clothes at London's Fashion Week, but you wouldn't mm. actually want to wear those crazy clothes yourself. No, exactly. And, and you, um, we're talking about books here, but of course yeah. you also have ukiyo-e prints, single sheet prints, which had actors and courtesans depicted in them. And, you know, they, they were comparatively cheap and people could buy one and put it on their wall or look at it. And So that's the purpose, isn't it, in yeah. a way, that if you can't afford, if you can't afford to go to the pleasure quarters, or if you can't afford to buy a fabulous yeah. kimono, then you can you can get a picture yeah. of it instead. Um, you said that kimono books kind of disappear, or rather, sorry, pattern books disappear around what the nineteen twenties. I wonder if is there any reason why they kind of fade away? Well, I think it it it, it goes with the perhaps the you know the decline in the in the wearing of kimono as a, as oh. an everyday object. Um, I think we see that men certainly during the Meiji period started to wear Western clothes quite early on. I think perhaps in one of the pictures that we saw in, in the film, you can see a train going through. And if you look carefully in the background, there are men, some men in kimono, but with a bowler hat. And, you know, it's a sign of the transition. Um, obviously, for women, the kimono was, was worn much longer, but as I said in the film, it, it gradually turns into not being an everyday garment, but something for special occasions. So how do you think people would buy a kimono today? Was that, again, outside your, <laughs> your field well, of knowledge? Well, you can look on the internet, you can see things. Oh. You can go into a department store. Yeah. Um, and, and there will be a range of kimono there. But there are also sort of high-end specialist um, kimono shops where you would go and it would probably a very similar 
consultation process to, to what we saw in the, in the Edo period. Yeah. I but mean, you'd need to be quite confident to do that, I think, to know what you were about and to have the, uh, the resources. Um, what I learned when I was living among geisha was that the um, geisha seemed to, seemed to require something like 36 kimonos <laughs> a year. I mean, people would also be buying new kimonos. I mean, the budget you'd need as a geisha would be rather enormous um, because you have a different, a different fabric each month, which, go, which obviously fits the seasons. Yeah. Um, and then, so that's 12 kimonos, but then you need, um, three, you need three different ones. You need one that you're wearing at the party, one that is off at the cleaners, <laughs> and one in case somebody spills, spills their drink on your kimono and you have to rush out and change it. Um, and the figure I had was something like five or 10,000 pounds for each kimono. Yeah. So you need to have, um, you need to have somebody that's funding a very you. rich patron. Yeah. yeah. Um, and presumably in the days of the courtesans, if you didn't have a very rich patron, there was very, very little chance of, um, of, of ever paying back that debt that's, that you initially had. Yeah. Um, but life as a geisha is obviously somewhat different today than it was in the past. I also I wonder whether this is again just speculating. I wonder whether geisha used pattern books. I don't know. I don't know. You've lived amongst them. Maybe <laughs> I was wondering I whether you'd, you'd come across that. I never came across... No, I never did. I never did. Um, I think this is quite a kind of an unusual side of Japanese culture, though hopefully with this exhibition it's become more kind of prevalent now. Maybe perhaps, hopefully, lots of people have watched, are watching us at this minute and will and we'll discover the wonderful world of pattern books. I mean, that that's what I hope. I think they're fascinating. We've with the help of the uh, Great Britain Sasakawa Foundation. We've digitised these. Mm. They're online on our website. I think the link will be uh, on your screens at the end of the, of the film. And you can come and see the, the, the real objects. Um, if you have a British Library Readers ticket, yeah. you're very welcome to come in, look at them, study them, be inspired by them, go away and make your own kimono patterns, who knows? Well, I've, I've certainly learned a lot about Japan um, and kimono and fashion through learning all about these wonderful pattern books. Um, I, I love the way it's so practical. It brings <laughs> us close to how, to how commerce operated and how real people really lived. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Hamish. It's my absolute pleasure. Um, and thank you very much, everyone, for joining us this evening um, and wishing you a lovely evening here from the British Library. <laughs>